G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to War Thunder. It's about time that I cover another Spitfire on the channel and here we are. This is the Spitfire F Mark 9. The F Mark 9 is probably the best Spitfire tier for tier in the game because it's just a good balance of armament, mobility, climb rate and energy retention. The Spitfires overall are fairly good, uh, but there are a couple of them that have some severe letdowns. The earlier Spitfires tend to be a fair bit more fragile. They tend to be not as strong. They tend to have uh, a lot more vulnerabilities. Uh, and of course, they also lack the 20 millimeter armament. The later Spitfires tend to be a little bit heavier. They're not quite the same as the original Spitfire. They end up becoming more of a boom and zoomer, uh, but they do have a couple of things that sort of trade off well with that. Now, uh, we're going to sort of have a look at this match. We're going to skip forward a little bit. But before we do, I'd just like to remind you guys that today, uh, as this video goes up, is the 25th of April, meaning that it is Anzac Day. And Anzac Day uh, commemorates the day that the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps uh, moved in on Gallipoli or on, in uh, Anzac Cove. Uh, it's a very solemn day for Australians and it's a good reminder for all of you guys all across the world to sort of remember the sacrifices that your relative armed forces have made. You uh, think about the life that you're living now and it's a bit of a privilege to sort of sit here and uh, fly the planes that we flew or the, sorry that they flew in the form of a video game. So uh, it, it's a very humbling to remember that and of course it's also a very good idea to remember the current servicemen and women who uh, are suffering from their uh, post-military life so uh, just keep those guys in your in your thoughts and um, maybe maybe if you see someone like that or if you know someone like that um, maybe send them a message have a chat with them so the Spitfire Mark 9 again the F meaning uh, it's sort of designed for those medium to high altitudes I understand that there is a, an LF and an HF. Now the LF is at 5.7, but uh, from what I can tell, it's pretty much the same. Um, I'm not really sure if it gets different settings or if it gets better fuel, I can't quite remember. Um, but I do know that functionally, these planes are more or less the same. Uh, one's at a higher battle rating and it's got different armament and that is the LF, which has the, uh, sorry, that, yeah, the LF, which has the uh, 50 cals. Now, I'm in a situation here which is very advantageous to the Spitfire. If you are in a turning plane, a plane that is good at dogfighting, and you have an altitude advantage over your opponents, provided that you have a decent amount of speed, uh, you will find that your time in this plane will be very easy. And you can see I have quite the altitude advantage here. Uh, don't worry, we'll cover sort of what you have in a less advantageous situ situation uh, in the next match. But I'm diving here on this J26, who decides to yeet himself into the Act 9T. And uh, BF-109 comes in at uh, 5 kilometers, slightly lower than me. And I've dived and leveled out. And you might think, well, why would you level out? Because you're kind of wasting energy here. But the other thing that the Spitfire really needs is speed. Speed is very, very key with the Spitfire. Now, if you have all the turning capability that you want, but you have not enough speed, it's actually very easy for a plane that doesn't turn quite as well to catch you out. But if you have speed, you can actually put more distance in those turns. Those those turning circles, for example, will be a lot higher, uh, a lot bigger, and you'll be able to get away from your opponent a lot easier. And that's one of the critical mistakes that Spitfire pilots tend to make, where they're not quite fast enough. They try and turn, but because they don't have the speed, they can't get away. And that's something to keep in mind when you're flying a Spitfire that whilst uh, everyone else has to kind of watch for their altitude and make sure that they don't turn, you've got to make sure you don't bleed too much speed because of course the trade-off that you get with this plane is that you can't you you can't keep speed as fast as much sorry you are not nearly as good at uh, energy retention and that's just the nature of the plane you're not a magical zero or an xp50 so what you have to do is ensure that you manage your speed properly now this also means zero throttling if you have to or, or reducing your throttle if you have to uh, using your flaps if it's appropriate uh, it also means that you have to make sure that you don't commit to too many turn fights the spitfire is one of those planes that really relies on a one versus one as well uh, and it's not very easy to sort of get yourself in that situation as a spitfire but you know the next game will kind of show you sort of what i'm looking for here now in this case here, in the match that's playing out, we have a couple of uh, bombers that are up at altitude, the BV-238, and I believe there might be another BV-238. Uh, no, it's a B-25. The B-25 is a fairly easy target. 
it's a little bit soft. Uh, it doesn't have too many guns. It's fairly compact and small compared to, say, a BV-238 or a B-17. So there are plenty of things to hit in terms of modules. But you'll find that this uh, plane is uh, kind of shit at dealing with bombers. Overall, the Spitfires are really poor at that. They don't have any armor. Uh, they're very soft. And you'll find that damage really, really, really badly hampers your performance. And so going after bombers in the Spitfire is a really risky situation. You don't, you don't really want to do it. But of course, these are the only two enemies left or, you know, there's, there's three guys, but uh, the third guy is back at base. So there's not really much else that we can do. We're going to go for these bombers instead. And it looks like the B-25 is traveling lower, slower, and is in front. Um, but I am physically closer to the BB-238, so if I can sort of keep my speed a little bit and uh, maybe I'll leave the BB-238 for a bit uh, and try my luck with the B-25, maybe that's the play, and it looks like that's what I'm going to do, simply because the uh, BB-238 is a little bit less of a sure kill. I'm, I'm fairly confident that I can get the BB-25, um, and simply those uh, spacings is what is key here, as well as the way that the B-25 is turning. It looks like he's fairly damaged as well, so he may have some gunners that are out. Uh, I'm going to start peppering him a little bit. I shouldn't come from the back because they have the most gunners in this sort of uh, position, this orientation. Uh, but you can tell that he's maneuvering, and this is probably an indicator, ooh, at least to me it's an indicator, that he's not using his gunners because very few bomber pilots tend to use their guns and their uh, control surfaces at the same time, especially if they're moving that gracefully. If they were, you know, sort of running around the whole place uh, doing these crazy maneuvers, then sure, uh, I would tend to be a bit more careful. But you can see I've set one fire. I'm going straight back to altitude. One, because I need the BB-238, and two, because I don't want to be on the receiving end of those 50 cals. So the B-25 there burns out, and that gives me kill number three, which is quite nice, fairly simple. And you'll find that in the Spitfire, your kills won't come particularly often. You won't be racking up huge amounts of kills, uh, but I found this plane to be extremely consistent. It seems to be one of the Spitfires that is able to get two or three kills on uh, pretty much every map, pretty much every match, provided that you aren't swarmed by opponents early on and or, or make some sort of critical mistake early on where you start, like head on a zero that's higher altitude than you. These type of situations are the ones that are least advantageous, but you know, when you put yourself in a situation where you do have an advantage, it really, really makes a difference. Now, speaking of advantage, I'm coming at the BB-238 from below. He's distracted, and I'm going straight for the throat here. Uh, I've gone for the pilot, but it looks like I've sawn off the tail instead. Um, you know, that's just the way it is. And you can see that I'm still receiving fire from the BB-238. It's still making its mark. So uh, it's it's definitely difficult to take out a BB-238. Just, uh, just be mindful when you do that. You need to keep your speed up, and you also need to keep your uh, your advantages. Make sure you have plenty of ammo, uh, and go for the throat. Either go for the engines, or go for the pilot. And uh, I tend to go for the pilot, but uh, it, it doesn't work out nearly as much as I would like. Anyway, moving on to the next match here, we do have a slight altitude advantage, and it looks like I'm going to target the year 2 first, just because I picked him off first. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a fairly quick job, and... Uh, yeah, the Year 2 doesn't really have too much to throw at uh, its opponents. Now, he is putting himself into a dive, which means I'm going to lead down. Uh, and I'm going to go straight for that pilot there, looking looking juicy there. Uh, I don't want to spend too much ammunition. I managed to take out one of his gunners. And it looks like he's going to be putting himself into a dive. He's coming close to the speeds that I'm looking at, which is about 600. Uh, and I know the Year 2 isn't going to survive much further down. I decided to just leave it at that and let him go because I can't really afford to waste too much energy on bombers. Uh, remember that this plane is particularly poor at fighting bombers simply because of the MG armament and the lack of uh, extensive cannon armament. So I think I would rather save that for the A6M5, which is going to be a nemesis here. Uh, the A6M5 is particularly potent. It's got a decent climb rate. It's got enough engine power, enough acceleration. It's got good guns. Uh, and that's kind of... If in the ballpark of what you do best, but slightly better. Um, I would honestly pick the A6M5 as the absolute pest of this battle rating. So maybe if you want to see some gameplay, some A6M5, let me know in the comments section below. Um, but of course, feel free to request what you might want to see. Uh, I know there have been some MiG-15 requests, so maybe I'll look at hitting that next. So this Zero is looking pretty juicy. He looks like he's not really looking at me. So I'm going to close the distance, but then he turns around and... It, now, 
I'm kind of confused as to as to what he's trying to do. He's going up into a vertical, which means that he's losing his speed, and he's turned around and he's doing exactly that thing that I was saying earlier, where he's got all of this turning ability but no speed, and he's already bled it all. And I managed to saw his tail off with one of the twenty mils. That is pretty much bang on what I'm talking about. How these particular planes need speed as well as that turning capability. Otherwise, you're not going to go anywhere. It's like, think about it at uh, 100 kilometers per hour versus 200 kilometers per hour. It doesn't matter how much turning force you put, you're going to end up with the sim similar amount of distance. Uh, it's just not going to work for you. So this, uh, this Fokker Wolf is also finding that things aren't going to work for him. Uh, I'm managing to get within my gun convergence. Now, I use a 600 gun convergence just because that's what I've always used. Uh, I probably could benefit from a 400, but you know what? I'll uh, leave it at this. I'm going to go into a vertical here, and you can see that the Focke Wolf has pretty much got nothing. I'm just going to sit behind him, keep my turns nice and tight, nice and flush, and he's pretty much got nothing. He's gone into a flat spin. The year 2 has gone down. I'm going to pepper the uh, A4 with some uh, 20 mils, no, 20 mils, 30 cals. And there's kill number three, nice and easy. Uh, funnily enough, that was the same Focke Wolf 190 from the first match that uh, had gone back to his airfield. That match had actually ended because the timer ran out for some reason. And uh, yeah, very, very disappointing. I would have liked to have seen that match to its end. Anyway, we have a fair few opponents left up on the board here. And uh, I'm just going to go look for them. Because the Spitfire, it doesn't have a particularly large amount of fuel. Uh, I, would, I would recommend taking about 20 minutes. Because otherwise you're going to be too heavy and you're going to start to lose your turning capabilities. But uh, at 20 minutes, you're also fairly limited to your range. Now, the Spitfire was one of those planes that... Uh, was uh, designed as an interceptor. I believe I believe it's a fighter interceptor, but I'm not, not particularly sure. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter. Early on in the Spitfire's life, it was, uh, you know, Battle of Britain fighting Heinkel 111s and BF 109s. Although, you know, we all know the Hurricanes did most of the work there. The Spitfire was one of the pivotal aircraft regardless. Um, over sort of the periods before, sorry, uh, before the invasion of Normandy and after the uh, Battle of Britain, they would do these weird sorties across the channel where they would go and uh, take a full load of fuel, they'd take a couple of blokes, and they'd just, uh, just pepper the, the shoreline, they'd find whatever they could, uh, I believe it's called a rhubarb, but um, we're going to go here for a quick head-on with the Focke Wolf 190, and I'm going to turn out of the way, you can see the speed that I've built up is barely enough to get out of his guns, and immediately I'm going to go into the vertical, which establishes dominance, it's like the you know, aeroplane version of a T-pose. You're uh, establishing your dominance and you are telling that Focke Wolf 190 that he cannot have the airspace above you and needs to dive down below like a little baby. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to even out my dive. I'm not going to go as steep as he is because I know he's got better energy retention. So when his speed bleeds off, I'm still going to be in a dive and still going to be gaining speed on him. And it looks like for now it is pretty much working. All I need to do is get close enough to pepper him with a couple of bullets and uh, sort of get him to turn in a way that's advantageous. But it looks like he's heading back to his airfield. I don't really want to bother with that. I think it's uh, really not something that I want. And just as I do that, I'm doing these sort of nice gentle maneuvers so that just in case I need to store back some energy, it's going to work. And it looks like it has. He's realized that I've turned away. And so he's going to go in for another head-on, which is really good news for me. I'm going to go for a quick burst here. Pull off at about 800. I get a critical hit on his left wing. Again, going up into the vertical to establish that T-pose dominance. And now that I have a lot more energy than he does, because he's come from a lower altitude and he's done a very, very heavy, heavy 180, I can simply dive on him. And because I've kept that altitude from before, I've uh, well and truly prepared myself for a dogfight like this. I'm going to pepper him there with the 30 cals. And it looks like I can still make a fair few amount of hits. I'm going to just try and get him with the 30 cals and hopefully he's going to crash into some trees or something. But if he isn't, again, I can always go around. And you can see that distance that I've made up here. It's uh, definitely, definitely making its difference here. Now, behind me, there was the Zero, another A6M5. And now, now I'm caught with my pants down. This is a bad situation. So I've got 300 Ks of airspeed. What I'm going to do, the Zero has sort of turned in around. I'm going to drop my, uh, or I'm going to sort of, Try and read what he's doing. I was going to drop my uh, altitude there, but it looks like the Zero is going in for that low speed fight. And now I'm below 250. My flaps work best. I'm going to try and go for the vertical dogfight. This is super, super close. Uh, and I'm trying to keep my airspeed under 250 so I can use my flaps, but I don't really think I'm going to keep this working. Now, 
I have tried to get away from the A6, but uh, I think he's going to make ground pretty quickly here. And uh, the Zero, my god, it just it just really outdoes the Spitfire. This is why I feel like the Zero is my, my nemesis. Uh, every time I try and play anything, P51s, anything like that, the A6 M5 is my absolute nemesis. So I'm going to drop my throttle and do a split S here, kill as much speed as I can, try and force an overshoot. I've gone underneath, and hopefully the Zero plays my game of uh, trying to drop speed and kill energy. I barely, barely make my way out of that. I don't know how I survived that, but uh, the A6M has decided to do some funny maneuvers, and uh, despite that, he's managed to land in front of my guns. Uh, I don't know what he's doing here, but he's somehow bungled this up so badly at, that I've been able to get a couple of shots here. I'm using my flaps, and you can see what I mean by all this turning and no speed means that you're just going to land yourself in hot water, and the A6M has just done exactly that. I, it's only a matter of time before I get my guns on, and I can I can actually sit behind him. I think I'm I think I'm good in this circumstance because he's not using any flaps. I don't really know what he's doing. I've set him on fire, and uh, as long as that fire keeps burning, that's pretty much game over. So. The Zero here could have probably won if he had used his noggin a little bit more, but I think I just got lucky, but my god, Zeros, when you kill them, it is such a uh, such a euphoric feel. Now, the Spitfire, one of the best. It's a beautiful plane, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, that'll do it for today. I hope you enjoyed. i like to remind you guys about uh, Anzac Day, and of course, all of the other lovely things. Uh, remember your, your veterans, remember the people that fought for your country. So ladies and gents, that'll do it for today. If you would like to support the channel, please head to the decal link in the description below. Alternatively, PayPal, Patreon, you know, all of the good things. Even just clicking like, even just leaving a comment would uh, boost the algorithm beautifully. Anyway, ladies and gents, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your time. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.